how does it feel to return to the pillow after a hiatus of about 20 years or so? These particular dancers might have been very, very young or not even born. So how does it feel to introduce this whole new generation to this historic place? Well, you know, dancers keep coming, they keep coming, and they keep going to Ailey, and they keep coming, and they keep, they keep going to Ailey, and they keep coming. And you know, when I looked on Ailey's roster, I like, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. But you know, I get them when they're younger, and I get them a chance to beat them up and kill them. And then uh, see them grow and move on. It's, you know, it's, there's, I have four-year-old kids say, I can't wait to be in Philadelphia. How did you select this performance before I have the dancers join in? This was a program that our new executive director said she knew Philadelphia, and there were three or four of the pieces that she wanted us to do. Enemy Behind the Gates, <laughs> Sweet on Blue, and then she saw us do at the Joyce uh, movement for, no, Super 8. Super 8. Super eight. Super eight. I said, well, wait a minute, I had to pick one. <laughs> so, you know, the new generation of choreographers have something else to say. I mean, the Tally Babies, the Lewis Johnsons, the Jean Hill Sagans, they moved on. And the new choreographers have something else to say. And I, I really thought that I, it would be remiss if I didn't do something from one of our new younger choreographers, uh, Anthony Burrell, who choreographs for Beyonce and Mariah Carey and Philodanko. Right, exactly. <laughs> His piece, I thought I should just bring it to the new generation of presenters and the people who come to the pillow. Uh, we were at the Joyce a couple of weeks ago and someone called me and said, are y'all doing the same program at the pillow? I said, of course not. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really important to me to ex maintain some of the works of the older choreographers, but introduce the new generation. Can you talk about the creative process behind endangered species from the different perspectives? Well, you know, unfortunately, um, Anthony Burrell, again, he was choreographing for Beyonce. He won a B, B, M, B, M, w, MTV Music, MTV Award, Music Award for <laughs> Formation. <laughs> and, you know, he's running. We've got four other choreographers. He's running in and out. So he really only had two weeks, two weeks to choreograph that and put it on the dancers. Uh, he just really wanted us to embody what was happening out in the world. And movement-wise, a lot of the movement really came from him. Um, and we would sometimes manipulate and then sometimes, but he was very strict about how he wanted his movement. But just even the names that were on our backs, we had to research those people. I, there was like a two that I didn't even know about that I've now learned because of just doing this piece. Uh, just, I did a lot of research. Just, and uh, you know, it varies. Some choreographers, one of the choreographers, they, in Phil if they live in Philadelphia, they have time to come and go, come and go. But if I have to bring them in, they have a short two or four weeks. But what I like to do is have them come back once they've set the piece, come back and look at it again. Come back and see if we've done what you want it done. So how does it feel? Just tell us a little bit about the process of learning a reconstructive work, Sweet on Blue, and how that feels maybe different or the same as we're learning to work with the choreographer in the space with you. It actually feels so much different because you usually would get the, the choreographer's input. And because the piece was originally sent on NDT, um, it was reconstructed on Phyllis Anko and it originally had 18 dancers. She, um, Kim, Kim Bears Bailey, who is our associate artistic director, reconstructed the piece and made it down to only eight dancers, four and four. And the intent of it was still the exact same way and it actually was shortened. It was originally six pieces, six different sections of the piece and she only did three. I loved her selection. It's just the build of the piece from the beginning to the middle to the end was perfect, especially with the type of rep we have. It was a drastic difference in comparison to the first piece. And the, the way it made me feel was beautiful. It was just moving. And I love moving like that. Just the flow of it was just so complimentary on everybody in bodies. So it's a beautiful work. I wish I was able to meet Jean Hale Singard, but Having to do his piece was like his spirit yeah. was in the room. Very well, you know, uh, Gene Hilsegan was from Philadelphia, and when he died, all of his works were a gift to Philadelphia. So I had to get the ballets from Bathsheba, Kibbutz, and all the other companies because he spent 14 years in Israel. And so we went through the repertory that he gave us, and 
Kim, who loved Jean Hill, say God, she selected Sweet on Blue to reconstruct. So you not only did Sweet on Blue, but how does it feel to have gone from endangered species and then had that pause, that break, and then go into Sweet on Blue and change their head, so to speak? Just talk to us about it. I don't want to give you any ideas. Yeah. Um... <laughs> The, um, that transition is a pretty big transition because you're going through this uh, really aggressive, uh, emotional um, piece that you have to really be in this whole different mindset of just approaching the movement in uh, an aggressive way. Whereas Sweet and Blue, I have to calm down, I have to breathe, I have to go into the clouds almost. Uh, and be more royal, and it's just a complete mind difference. I have to close my eyes, I have to really breathe, take myself out, become whoever character I am in that piece, and embody it. I hope that you're not just watching dancers on stage, that you're actually watching a movie, that you really are enjoying yourself and watching a story happen, and not just movement, not just arms and legs and limbs moving in the space. So I just hope that something resonates to you and that you can go home and have a conversation about any of those pieces and that it sparks some sort of conversation for something. Well, you know, when I started the company, uh, I had a dancing school first. And dancing school for 10 years was paying for everything. And so I had to teach powder Blu-ray, as the kids say. Powder Blu-ray. And whatever, whatever we had to do to keep the co company going. So I shifted the company around the school and we would always have classes after dancing school. But it worked out good because a lot of the dancers could go to college. A lot, all the dancers almost have degrees now. Yes. Uh, some of them got degrees. We were on the bus in Germany. I see the light on and somebody's working on their degree. Uh, but some of the girls teach in schools in the daytimes. They don't have to be bartenders or busboys or maids because they have the day to themselves. Uh, and then they're used to dancing at night. So when we dance at night here, it's, it's regular stuff. Yeah. It's not that they've danced all day and tired at night. It's reverse. And so uh, I try, also I say that I can't pay them as much as I like, so I'm not gonna make them work eight hours. But they do a lot of extra stuff on their own. They go to class in the day. They teach in the day. So there, there's a constant momentum of growth and Joe is also the director of one of the, comp the, the dance companies, right? You want to tell them about that? Uh, yeah, I'm the, the director for the third company, D3. Um, it's just choreography, bringing in choreographers and shaping young teenagers between 13 and 18 yes. before they go to college, pretty much, um, and just getting them ready for dance, giving them an opportunity to dance before college. And in that way, Ms. Brown also cultivates leaders, next generational leaders. She also has other dancers in the company that direct this other companies. I think we have four companies now. Yeah, we have four companies now. The main company, they get paid 52 weeks of the year because I say if polymers get paid every week, my dancers should get paid every week. No more layoffs. You don't know what you're going to do for eight, two months, three months. They know that they have a job. Uh, then we have a second company, because when I have auditions, I'm looking for one dancer, I got 60, I'm like, what am I gonna do with the rest of them? I have a second company so that they get the experience. We pay them when they perform, but we give them free classes, dance for them. Then I look at my teenagers whose mother say, when you go to college, you gotta be a doctor. I'm like, but she wants to be a dancer. So if they see them dance, see them perform, they, the parents are more readily to encourage them, but thankfully now they can take dance in college. Then I looked at, I had my girls nine to 12. Yes. Those little girls and boys kill it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm one of my teachers who teaches at the University of the Arts. I gave him my, my, my minis this year. He said, I gotta go back and get ready for these kids. So, you know, the generations keep coming and we have to make places for them. Being here at the Pillow has been like a dream. I did the contemporary program when I was in college. So being in the program and then coming back and being in the company and performing on these stages is like a godsend. I'm like so in awe right now just to be performing on these stages. Secondly, the pieces are very iconic to me, especially with the rep that Philodenko has. It's a very eclectic mix of pieces, and I'm happy to be here to showcase the works that we have. Um, it's just, for instance, the pieces build. 
I'm not gonna lie to you, the stamina is very hard, but I really enjoy it and the goal is to just be in the mindset for each piece, focus on what I have to do, change my head, change my costume in a sense, and then go into the next piece. And honestly, it's been a joy just being here. Regardless of how tired we are, it's still a wonderful place to be and to perform. So I'm happy to be here. My thing is that all I ever want to do is put dancers on stage and let them dance. But you know, I got to fundraise, I got to smile and grin, I got to shake hands, I have to run all over the place. I have to convince people that these dances should be seen. So, you know, it continues to be a hard job. And I'm like, Whew, I got to do this again. And in, in, in uh, 2020, Phil Danko will be 50 years old. And I keep saying, I don't know how that happened because I'm 47. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then my school will be 60 years old, so we're going to start celebrating. I'm like, it's time to celebrate, so I'm going to do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yay. Celebrate. Yes. Yay.